Hello everyone, before we start the video, I would like to thank today's sponsor, The First Descendant. The First Descendant is a third-person co-op RPG shooter allowing four players to group up with 10 different characters to choose from during the beta, all with unique skills and chaining actions. You and your team will be taking on massive boss enemies of varying difficulty with unique abilities of their own. The grappling hook allows for dynamic gameplay, letting you move throughout the game without limit, including parts of a boss's body, which you can then extract from the boss itself. Set in a sci-fi fantasy world, players will become the descendant, inheriting unknown powers, trying to figure out where they came from, while also fighting off invaders of the Ingress continent. The Steam beta test will be happening October 20th through the 26th. If you wish to sign up for the beta, use my link in the description, which will send you to the Steam store to register. Be sure to add the game to your favorites as well if you are interested, and check out the full trailer also linked in the description. Thank you very much to The First Descendants for sponsoring this video. And now it's time for the video. King's Fall, it's back. It's finally back from D1 many, many years later. Let's talk about it. When I talked about Vault of Glass, there was a bit more to critique as I don't think Vault of Glass in D1 aged very well. It was the very first raid in the game and in 2014, it was amazing. But we have seen much better days when it comes to raids. King's Fall was only a year later and is still one of the most memorable raid experiences in the franchise. And while it needed some tweaks, I don't think it needed as much work as D1 did. I've been seeing some pretty positive responses to King's Fall, and I'm not gonna lie, it feels amazing to have it in Destiny 2. The Taken King was such an important expansion to the franchise, and getting to revisit it in any sort of way was just, I, I don't know, it just, it just makes me feel nice. You know, it, it just feels so nice to have it back in the game. It's one of the very few things that I am nostalgic for from Destiny 1. It was just so good at a time where the franchise really needed a big, big boost in the Taken King, and the Taken King was so nice. So yeah, it, it just feels really good. So let's talk about the raid, let's talk about some of the changes, and then we'll talk about the raid race and the challenge modes and all that kind of stuff. The entrance, no real significant changes. Bungie added a timer on screen, but you still basically do this the same way. I wasn't anticipating much here. The totem encounter introduced the main way in which the raid as a whole has changed. The brand claimer buff is now everywhere instead of just Oryx. Instead of letting the aura buff simply rotate to whoever else was underneath the aura with you, it needs to be stolen. This was a nice little shot of adrenaline to this encounter as it splits your two teams of three so that everyone is doing something unique at the same time. Deathsinger's power is earned from killing stuff meaning if you're not letting the right person kill things, you're gonna go slower. So enemy density, while very slightly cranked up, didn't need a massive adjustment. Plus, the person under the Annihilator Totem is most often gonna be by themselves, and the enemy density that was around in Destiny 1 was mainly kept in these rooms, which was fine because there's only gonna be one person in here doing most of the killing anyway. Although the left side totem feels like it needs more enemies spawning in. It gets pretty boring over there. The right side's way more entertaining. I don't know what's up with that. One of the issues I was going to have with this place is that because we're so powerful, simply standing around killing enemies wasn't really going to be enough. There's no combat complexity there, and there would be very little mechanical depth. If you're not going to have one of those, you need the other. The gauntlet in Vow is not mechanically deep, but it's very combat intense. Riven isn't a super combat intense encounter, but it just has a lot of stuff going on. I guess Valkor would be another example. This change puts a little more urgency into the fight. It's now about speed, it's about knowing the rotation you need to be in, but combat is still a little tense. It gets tougher as you have people die, but hopefully you're not having people die. If it weren't for Solar 3.0 just healing the crap out of everybody, this encounter might actually get a little tough on normal mode, but we're gonna talk about Solar later. I love the rotations, I love that there are a bunch of moving parts, it makes things feel really active, but the fight itself is only four minutes long, assuming you're not really messing anything up, which is long enough that by the time you're starting to get bored or by the time 
things are starting to get out of hand, in case you're struggling, it's over. This buff stealing mechanic carries over into the War Priest, which definitely makes the damage phase a bit more interesting, at least for a couple of people. Everyone else still basically just gets the stand there, but now the work is divided among two or three people instead of just one, which is fine and is much more in line with today's experiences. After doing this fight on normal mode though, it is more or less the same as it was in Destiny 1. The plate order mechanic also makes it so multiple people need to do stuff, but it's not really anything dramatic. A couple of people looking at totems instead of just one. Most teams I think are gonna two phase War Priest. Super Pro teams might do it in one, which is exactly how it was in Destiny 1. I'm willing to let this slide because I don't feel like I really felt the effect of War Priest gaining more powers over time. I still think it's a neat idea, but it just didn't really feel as impactful in D2 compared to D1, where things actually got pretty scary. And I think that's because we were so much more easily threatened in Destiny 1. Destiny 1 didn't have resist mods, resilience, damage resist, crazy healing. It had permadeath if you died during a hard mode. That's what it had. The things that were a threat in Destiny 1 are nothing compared to Destiny 2 though, and unless War Priest was gonna go wild with new traits, then I overestimated this mechanic way too heavily in terms of its impact. Combat in this fight is still relatively boring though, especially with Solar Titans and Hunters literally able to spawn trap things as they come out of the door. Destiny 1's combat wasn't anything to write home about either though. Feels like they could have ramped up the amount of enemies here given that the first minute of this fight is just waiting for things to spawn while we wait for the mechanic to happen. At least give us some more stuff to kill. The fight's better overall, but I'm still not the craziest about it. Golgoroth got, I want to say next to no changes, but it's not a fight that really needed that many to begin with. You have significantly more enemies spawning in, which further emphasizes Solar's dominance as a subclass, but the pools are the same, the orbs are the same, the taunt is mostly the same. Unstable Light now damages Golgoroth. I think that was a big community request. The Taken transition is still there too. Is it possible to one cycle Golgoroth? It definitely is, as you will watch right here, even with the one-off challenge happening in the background. Most teams are likely to two cycle, but Bungie did something about the one orb strat by attaching unused orbs to the Tablet of Ruin, and you do not get many free slots on the Tablet of Ruin. It seems like the average team, at least until whatever crap comes out that lets people annihilate this boss in two orbs, is gonna have to actually do the fight. And that brings me great joy, because this fight is wonderful. It's the best fight in the franchise, and it's finally back in Destiny 2. I love it. Also, Golgoroth got its enemy density increased, but War Priest didn't. Like, you already have one of the most intense mechanical fights in the game in Golgoroth. Several mechanics going on at the same time. And then you added so many more enemies to the fight while you're doing damage to Golgoroth. But War Priest got maybe a couple more enemies thrown in during the slow part of the fight. Like, how does that work? I love the enemies in Golgoroth. Let's get that energy into War Priest 2. Like, what's going on there? Then we get to Daughters, and this is a fight that was very likely to get extended in duration in some way. Bungie doesn't really do the whole super short pre-final boss encounter type deal anymore. So giving away some free loot for a two-minute fight was probably not how things were going to go down. Now it's four minutes, or a little bit less than four minutes. The plate and platforming changes, I think, are good, or at the very least, are neutral. One fewer person needed for the plate sequence is nice. Multiple people having to run, I'm indifferent to that, but it does give more opportunities to learn, which is always good, and it introduces a bit more chaos into some of these fights. A little bit more random chaos, which I think is fine. Fewer platforms to jump on is also okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really have much to say here. I like the changes. I think they fit with the D2 raid style. One runner doesn't feel like how things are done in D2. Gotta get more people into the mix. I think it's fine. The orcs encounter, I think, got changed in the exact way that people were hoping. Dealing damage to orcs and not having the fight be time-gated by bombs. This fight probably wasn't going to get a ton of changes in the first place thanks to its already complex nature. And it didn't. The flow of the fight is the same, 
There are a couple more plates to run, obviously, but all of the mechanics were pretty much otherwise unchanged. Given the vast differences in ammo economy and just strength of weapons in D2 versus D1, damaging Oryx in D1 didn't really make that much sense because we would run out of ammo so quickly. But in D2, our weapons just hit so much harder and only ogres absorbing our weapon damage would not have been close to enough. The bombs stunning Oryx and then us doing damage is great. Although I definitely would have liked Oryx to have, like, you know, done something while we're shooting him. I know he's stunned, but the Oryx model is just kind of sitting there eating linear fusion shots. I also know that we're completely immune to damage and all that, but just, I don't know, make him look like he's in pain or something. I don't know, very minor gripe. Hopefully you get what I mean. The final stand is a bit more exciting as well versus what it was in D1, which was... I mean, you can kill him with a Celestial Nighthawk shot in D1 for the final stand, and that was it. Overall, I think Bungie did a fantastic job revamping King's Fall. Other than some War Priest stuff, I don't think I have any significant complaints whatsoever, and even my War Priest complaints aren't really that significant. The feedback from the community has been fantastic as well, so bravo on a job well done restoring this raid into Destiny 2. Which brings me to the day one experience. The power creep continues when it comes to day one raid races, this time in the form of Solar 3.0. Solar 3.0 is so good. I feel like I just end the sentence right there. Uh, it's so good and we have so many good tools at our disposal that combat is just not really a threat anymore. I know I've been saying this for like the past, what, three or four raids now, but it's still true. The amount of healing and damage this subclass is capable of, even in a day one raid experience, is wild. Even comparing to Vow, which was only six months ago, we're even more ridiculously strong because of the resilience changes and the subclass changes. We'll talk about this more in a moment. Who would have thought that War Priest was going to be the wall that everyone hit before they packed it up? War Priest ended up being the Atrax of the day because of the brutally high damage requirements. Bungie posted some numbers in terms of how many teams killed each boss on Normal and Challenge. And overall, while 158,000 teams did totems on Normal Mode, only 63,000 teams ended up beating the War Priest. On Challenge Mode, 31,000 teams beat totems, but only 21,000 beat War Priest. The rest of the data further shows how tough War Priest was because of the teams that beat War Priest, 77% of them would go on to beat Oryx on normal mode, and of the teams that beat War Priest on challenge, 79% of teams would go on to kill Oryx. War Priest ended up highlighting an issue that I had with some parts of the raid, and that was power ammo. During War Priest, you could hit some Aeon finishers on some wizards and mostly be okay. But when you have a fight as tightly tuned as War Priest during a day one challenge, to the point where you basically need constantly fully replenished power ammo and you're not getting it, that kind of creates an issue. I respect having to balance the use of power ammo in something like a Grandmaster, or at least I used to before Aeons became what they became. You could spam all your power ammo on everything early, but then when it got to later in the strike, if you weren't getting consistent drops, you would be out of luck. But you could get away with using special weapons and primary weapons if you wanted to conserve that ammo for later. In the raid, you were at the mercy of power ammo a good amount of the time, unless you were one of the top 20 teams in the world and had perfect buff stacking, synergy, font of might, yada yada. And even then, teams struggled. My team struggled. We beat War Priest Challenge by the skin of our teeth. We all died after the kill to the white mechanic. That's how close it was. And during Golgoroth, it got even worse because there weren't as many targets for Aeons, but the damage requirements weren't as intense, so it was more okay. Plus, you could rotate people who did have ammo because they were doing the taunting. I guess you could argue the same for the War Priest aura buff, but you still get at least a little bit of damage time on War Priest, even if you're doing the aura. The worst of it was on Oryx, who I don't think has any targets for Aeons in the entire fight. You just need to hope that ammo drops. And like, that was it. And I cannot describe what a bad feeling it is to just be on a good run and then have no power ammo drop, especially when getting to the final stand, which is a very sizable chunk of health. And I just have to be plink plonking away with the sniper doing 17,000 a shot when I could be doing 
80 something with a linear if I just had the ammo. I'm not exactly sure what the solution is there though because if you just dump power ammo on everyone all of the time, it can negate some of that urgency, the urgency to hit shots, hit your crits, or only use it in the right places at the right times. But man, does it just feel really bad to not have any of it drop when damage requirements are so strict during the day one raid race. The raid race was on a Friday, a mere three days after the new season, like the old days. Part of that was because Bungie probably didn't want to do it over Labor Day weekend, understandable. Part of it was because people just don't work on Saturdays and if something went wrong, the timetable to fix those things is much longer. Very understandable, obviously no real easy way of solving the problem. This does end up meaning lower population in terms of people running the raid, which definitely does stink. According to Raid.Report, 423,000 accounts played VOG back in Season 14 on Contest, while only 344,000 played King's Fall this time around. Vow was 384,000 accounts in the first 24 hours for reference. Pretty large chunk of players gone. Pretty unfortunate. Something that I found quite interesting, though, were the number of clears. Vault of Glass challenge mode on day one had just over 2,800 clears. Not unique clears, just total clears. King's Fall, under the same conditions, just under 3,000. I think it was 2,974, 2,984, something like that, around there. Normal mode completions on day one. Vault was 37,547 accounts. King's Fall was 49,319. So despite fewer people being able to compete, we had almost double the percentage of people, 8.8% for Vault, 14.3% for King's Fall, complete a normal mode run. For reference, again, Vow was 8.3% normal, but that was after 48 hours. It was only 1.3% within the first 24, but there were a lot of technical issues with that. Also, King's Fall normal had the second highest day one success rate of any raid released in Destiny 2. I think this is partly because the kind of people who would be willing to take off work that day are the kind of people who are more confident in their ability to clear it. But I also think, here comes Elitist Dado, oh boy, here we go. I also think it's the fact that even in between this raid and the previous raid, six months, we've grown even stronger. I don't know how it's possible we're even stronger than we were in Vow. Solar 3.0, resilience changes. A lot of things are simply not punished to the degree that they used to be. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are only gonna hear Dado mad about lesser skilled players getting through day one raids, which isn't what I'm saying, but here we go. People do not need to play as sharp or as cautious as you used to. Old man Dado hitting you with the back in my day. But it's true. I've done every single raid. It's only gotten easier. Look, day one raids are always going to be a struggle for the overwhelming majority of teams. If you can get through one, you are part of the top like 0.1% of teams in the world, if not even a smaller percentage than that. The Warpriest damage wall was clear proof that you need to know more than just the basics to succeed, and you need six strong, competent players if you want chances. But what I am saying is look at my team's Golgroth kill. I was joking around with Crimson, completely ignoring one of the most important things in the entire fight, which are the Golgroth darts that he fires at you, and I was face tanking them with Lord Lay, and it didn't even matter. Spawn trapping enemies on day one in a day one raid experience is never something I would have imagined happening, but that's exactly what teams are doing. It is wild. Come on. I, did, I don't think that should be happening. The combat experience is getting absolutely trounced. Is this an issue with the game as a whole? Maybe it's just Lorelei? Maybe it's just Solar 3.0? Yeah, maybe. But we still have some pretty bonkers builds on other subclasses that we can generate to nullify a lot of the challenge of the combat experience in a day one raid. And I'd love to somehow get back to situations where I need to care a bit more about the combat experience versus just AoEing stuff down with a Sunspot and a Trinity Ghoul. I'm not scared at all of the overwhelming majority of enemies. I'm not scared of knights hitting me with a sword. I should need to be playing 
very cautiously, and I am not at all. Again, I'm not trying to say that too many people are clearing the raid or that people are clearing the raid because it's too easy or anything. I am simply expressing the desire to have my mistakes actually be punished and to have combat actually kind of scary again. Because right now, it's not. Let's review the challenge modes that will unlock in like a month or something. The totems encounter made it so you had to rotate the sides that you were on. This is an okay challenge, probably one of the few that you can actually do with relative consistency. Uh, not very challenging, though, uh, even on contest mode. The War Priest challenge ended up being a doozy on day one, where you had to pick up the brand claimer buff and steal the aura within a very short amount of time. On contest mode, definitely was a challenge with the damage requirements, especially the way my team ended up doing the fight. But as strategies get better, this is not going to be as brutal. But you still got to be quick. There is still at least an execution factor to this challenge. Golgroth, my team went into this thinking that the D1 challenge was going to be the challenge, and it was the one-off challenge, not the one that you needed for the world first race. The actual challenge is where you need to step into the pool as the gaze holder. This can be done at the last second. You just hop in when you have a couple of seconds to go on your timer. You touch the pool, and that's it. Uh, not very impressed with this one. Kind of disappointed by it, actually. Not really that much of a challenge. The Daughter's Encounter is where you can't step on the same plate more than once in a cycle. This is a challenge type thing that we've seen before. Can only shoot a thing once, step on a thing once, touch a thing once. Not the most exciting. I think the one-off is way more fun where the torn player cannot touch the ground. That was way more fun. Finally, the Oryx Challenge was just the... You can only kill an ogre and a knight from a certain position once during the fight. So if you killed, like, both right side ogres, then you couldn't kill them again for the rest of the fight. You couldn't get the killing blow. I really don't get any enjoyment from challenges like this at all. My team almost RNG'd our way through this challenge during day one. We did two full cycles just randomly without knowing what the challenge was. And I think if you're able to do that, I just don't think it's the greatest challenge in the world. I think people were expecting some sort of kill the light eater knights while they're eating the bomb type deal here. And while I guess it's good that they didn't go through with what people expected. I mean, although the light eater knight challenge would have been ridiculous to do as it stands right now. Because the knights might as well be Joey Chestnut up in here. They eat them in like half of a second. The timer would need to be a little bit longer. Like, they would need two or three seconds to eat them. Because right now, it'd be near impossible to even do. The one-off challenge ended up, again, being more fun. But the one-off here, where you can only stun Oryx once before he does final stand, might have not been the most feasible for the day one experience for a lot of teams. I don't know. Overall... Great job on King's Fall as a whole. The raid is really good. It's really fun. It is a blast to have back in the game. The nostalgia is awesome. I, I love it. I think my concerns continue to be about the day one experience and the game getting easier and not as punishing versus the raids themselves. I know people are going to want to know about the tier list stuff. I think King's Fall Normal is going definitely either in the, yeah, I'll run a couple, or the Raid Night tiers. Uh, I need some more runs under my belt first before really coming to a consensus. In terms of day one experiences, I think it's definitely towards the top. Not as good as Last Wish, not as good as VOG D1. I think I'd put it fourth place behind Crota's end D1. But again, I need some time to reflect on it. My team got ninth place, and we were in the thick of it for quite a while, especially with our second try Golgroth kill. But figuring out the actual challenges during the challenge run is what became our undoing. We just could not get a lock on what some of the challenges were quick enough. It felt like we tried everything other than the right thing, and it just took us too long to figure out, which is something we're gonna be working on for next time. However, considering we got 25th in VOG last year, this was a dramatic improvement for us, and I'm really proud of how well we did and how well we continue to perform despite us only playing together like twice a year or something like that. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.